Let us say we abide in the word of God. And the word of God abides in us. We produce good fruit for the kingdom of God. The love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us now and forever. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. The title of the message is Jesus Christ, our healer. Hallelujah. Let us confess and say Jesus Christ is our healer. I don't know what medical doctor has told you. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Today I am here to invite us through scripture to believe once more in healing. Yes. In a generation where there is a lot of unbelief and a lot of wickedness as a result of unbelief, I'm here to invite you, my brother, my sister, that we must believe once more in a miracle working God. Look at your neighbor and say, do you believe that God works miracles. Ask them again. Say, do you believe that God is still working miracles? Ask them a different question. Do you believe that God was working miracles in the past? And is no longer working them in the present? Because that's what some people believe. They don't have a problem with a miracle-working God, but they've got a, a problem with a miracle-working God in the present. Almost all people who confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or all people who go to church, when you ask them, do you believe God performs miracles, they say yes. And then the issue becomes the when. The when. Some, they say, ah, God performed miracles in the past. Right now, we have to rely on doctors, as if it's, it's written in scripture that we must rely on doctors. Hallelujah. I've got nothing against doctors. I, actually, I've got relatives who work in the medical fraternity. Relatives and friends, very close friends, who are working in the medical field. Some as nurses, some as pharmacists, and uh, quite a number as medical doctors. I've got lots of friends who are medical doctors. But the good thing is that the Doctors and nurses and pharmacists and other medical practitioners that I have for friends, they believe in healing. They've told me several times when they encounter a situation for which they... Do you know that doctors sometimes encounter situations for which they've got no diagnosis? Yes. The person will be clearly sick, but they cannot explain why a person is sick. And in that situation, those friends of mine who are Christians, who believe in God, who believe in Christ, they, they, they've told me in the past that they pray to God, and God normally moves in terms of healing. Sometimes one of them told me that there was a time when he prescribed very, I mean, innocent medication, which doesn't tally with the amount of pain that a patient was experiencing. But God moved dynamically in the situation, and the person experienced healing. For some instances, the person just recovered. You know, the doctor said, continue with the medication for suppressing pain, and the person became completely healed just because the doctor believed in Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Because some diseases are physiological in nature. They are physical. The disease will be located in the physical. Meaning to say that there is something wrong with your body, something wrong with your anatomy, your body, your physical body. Something has been damaged. Hallelujah. One way or the other, because the body, our body is because of atomic sin, they grow old. At a certain point, we grow old. No matter how much faith you have, and how much you watch your diet, and how much you exercise, at a certain point, you are going to grow old. Look at your neighbor and say, you are going to grow old. It's not a case, it's a fact. It's a fact. Hallelujah. It is a fact that all of us are going to grow old. Look at your neighbor and say, you are going to grow old. Hallelujah. 
human beings were not designed by God to grow old. Do you know that? Hallelujah. They were not designed by God to grow old. They were designed by God to grow up to a certain stage and then to stop growing. To just remain at that stage. Do you think angels, they grow old? Holy angels. Because Gabriel is mentioned in the book of Daniel. And the same Gabriel is mentioned in Luke chapter 1. After more than 1,000 years, he's still the same Gabriel that was speaking in the book of Daniel. And Daniel had long died. It was centuries after Daniel had died. No one could even find a trace of Daniel. And the same Gabriel comes and says, I'm from the presence of God. I've come with a message for you to marry the mother of Jesus Christ. Angels do not grow old. Look at your neighbor and say, angels do not grow old. That's why in the Bible, according to the Bible, they would appear as young men. Sometimes they would appear as grown-up men. They would appear as young men. Because angels do not grow old. They are spirits. They don't grow old. Look at your neighbor and say, angels do not grow old. Human beings, they grow old because we have got a physical body. A human being is a tripartite thing. Look at your neighbor and say, you are tripartite. What does it mean? When we say you are tripartite, because for us to talk about healing, you have to understand who you are according to the word of God. Your identity according to the word of God. If you don't understand your identity according to the word of God, you will violate certain principles which impinge your on your identity as a child of God. And it will begin to ruin your life and it will manifest in the physical as sicknesses. Some sicknesses, they go away when we start to follow the right kind of spiritual principles. Because man is tripartite. Hallelujah. No matter how much you concentrate on your physical part, if you violate your soul and you violate your spirit, at a certain point you will experience unexplainable pains and sicknesses. You, you won't be able to explain where the pains and sicknesses are coming from. Hallelujah. I told you that some diseases are physical, which means the disease is located in your port. Maybe when you fall, you experience a painful knee. There is nothing spiritual about that. It's because you fell with your knees and during the process of healing, you will be feeling pain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God has got healing for sickness, whether it's in the physical or it's in the soul or it's in your human spirit, regardless of where sickness is coming from. God, I am not talking about myself as a pastor. I've never healed anyone. Look at your neighbor and say the pastor has never healed anyone. Say the pastor has never healed anyone. And look at your neighbor and say, the pastor has never cast out even a single demon. Hallelujah. If you see me looking like I'm casting out demons, it's the spirit of Jesus that will be using me. Hallelujah. And God can use anyone who, who has got a willing heart, who allows themselves to be prepared by God. Because for God to use you, you have to undergo preparation. In fact, you can't even use anything yourself without preparing it. You can't use your, no matter how beautiful your home is, you can't use it as a venue for a wedding unless you prepare it. The same way God cannot use anyone unless the person undergoes preparation. So God has got people that he wants to use in this season, in these last days, to, to minister healing. Not so that God can eliminate all sicknesses, but so that God can show us and demonstrate to us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at your neighbor and say, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at your neighbor once more and ask them, does your own God that you worship change? Look at your neighbor and say exuberantly, my own court does, does not change. Look at your neighbor and say by faith and exuberantly that if your own court changes, if your own court changes try, my God, try my God, who doesn't change. Who doesn't change. 
He is the same yesterday, he is the same yesterday. Today, today, and forever. And forever. Let us go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 23 so that you just get a glimpse of your identity according to the word of God. Not really your identity in Christ, your identity as a human being. Because you have to understand yourself as a human being. If your conceptualization of yourself as a human being, you just imagine yourself as an animate body, that's where now your problems will be beginning from. Hallelujah. Because a human being is more of a spirit than a physical body. Say, I am more of a spirit, more of a spirit. than a physical body. And most of the things that you need, if you didn't realize, I will tell you, I may prove it at a later time using scripture. Most of the things that you need, if not all of them, they are located in the spirit. Say everything which I need, which I need is, located in the is located in the spirit. Because you are more of a spirit than a physical part. In fact, you are not even a physical part. Even in different languages, when a person has died, they say the body of, we are doing body viewing, we were viewing the body of so and so. The question is, where is so and so? Whose body we were viewing? That person will no longer be there. It means the person is the spirit which animates the body. Say, I am the spirit. I am the spirit. Which animates the body that you are looking at. Say, I am, the spirit. I am the spirit that animates the body that, that you are looking at. Let us hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many aspects of a human being are mentioned? Spirit, soul, and what? Body. And one thing which I want you to realize is that even though in most of our prayers and in most of our thinking, we normally start with the body. We normally say body, soul, and spirit. But when the Bible is mentioning, it starts with the what? The most important, which is the what? The spirit. Say the spirit. The spirit. Say the soul. The soul. Say the body. Why is the pot mentioned last? Look at your neighbor and say, why is the pot mentioned last? Why is the mentioned? Jesus Christ gives us the, the reason in John chapter 6, verse 63, why the pot is mentioned last. Look at your neighbor and ask them once more, why is the pot mentioned, mentioned last? It says in verse 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits how many things? Nothing. Just to put the scripture on the, yeah. It says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits how many things? The flesh which we concentrate so much on feeding. The flesh which we concentrate so much on clothing. I am not saying we should not feed our bodies. And I'm not saying we should not wash our bodies. I am not saying we should not look after our bodies. After all, the Bible says, your body is the house of the Holy Spirit. Because when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, a temple is a house for God to operate in. Hallelujah. Amen. It means your body is a what? Is a house. Say my body is the house of my spirit. And according to the design of God, your body was designed so that it is not only the house of your spirit, but also the house of God himself. So that God will be directing you by the Holy Spirit from within your body. These people that you see genuinely prophesying, it means within their bodies, which are the house of their spirit, there is the Holy Spirit whom you cannot see. Just like we cannot see your spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't see my spirit. All that you can see is my physical part. Animated by my spirit. Say all that you can see is my physical part. Animated by my spirit. Hallelujah. Say today I'm going to yield to the influence of the Holy Spirit. 
Say, O oh, Holy Spirit. May you take over my life and purify my conscience by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Your body is just a house. It's just a house. The Apostle Paul reminds us that the body is actually a house. Jesus Christ says the flesh profits how many things? Nothing. When it comes to spiritual profit, your body profits how many things? Nothing. It means the impact of the body for it to be eternal, you have to yield it to, to God, to the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us go to Romans chapter 12 so that you understand the function of your point. Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read two verses, verse 1 and verse 2. It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the message of God, that you present your what? Your bodies. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do you realize that the body is something which you actually possess, which you can present to someone, to God? If you are married, you can present your body to your husband or to your wife. Hallelujah. A body is something which you actually possess, which you can present to God. And similarly, in the same way you can present your body to God, you can present it to Satan. Hallelujah. Your body is something which you possess. Say, my body is something which I possess. My body is something which I possess. I can present it. To whomever I choose, to whomever I choose. As, a as a sacrifice, say my body is something which I possess. My body is which I possess. So when people are speaking that we are going to do body viewing, the body, the corpse of so and so has arrived, they are not wrong. Their statement is entirely scriptural. And the amazing thing is that even people who don't know the Bible, they speak like that. They don't, so, they don't say, so and so has arrived, let us come and see him. They are always accurate in any language, in China, in Arab countries, wherever we may differ in terms of what we worship and how we worship and when we worship. But when it comes to our understanding that the body is not a person, in virtually all regions of the earth, there is an understanding that the body is not actually a person. Say my body is actually not me. Now, if in your behavior you start to behave like your pot is actually you, that your identity is actually your pot, that's where your problems start from. Right. Hallelujah. Because you are a spirit, and the things that you need are there in the spirit. Say, the things that I need are there in the spirit. Because the question, the easy question is, when Jesus Christ was praying for the sick and they were experiencing healing, where was the healing coming from? Because Jesus Christ was not giving them anything. He was just releasing spoken words. He would tell them, your faith has made you all. And these people would experience healing. In one instance, Jesus Christ was touched by a woman with a hemorrhage who was flowing, she had an issue of blood. And Jesus Christ said, I perceived virtue or power or energy coming out of me. And then Jesus Christ was looking for the destination of that energy, that virtue. I tell you today, someone who has got faith will touch the hem of Jesus Christ's garment and virtue will flow from Jesus Christ himself to their diseased body and they are going to experience healing. So that it may be known that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. If there is something or someone who is dwelling in your house without your knowledge, your house, I'm referring to your board, that someone is going to be ejected by the Spirit of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Because we are living in a season where God wants to heal and to restore his children so that he can use them to preach the gospel in these last days. Which is why I'm talking about the true identity of a human being. That you are a spirit, you are not a physical board. Say, I am a spirit. I am, a spirit. I am not a physical board. Say, my body is an instrument. 
which I presented to God, as a living sacrifice. Say, my body is an instrument, which I have presented to God, for a reasonable service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So according to God, your body is something which you can present as a living sacrifice. It means God does not actually kill your body. When you present it to him, he begins to use it for his own glory. Right. Now, when we read that verse, it's clear that if you don't present your body to God, you will never use it. And by default, someone who is also a spirit like God, he will begin to use your pot. If you decide not to, dis to, to present your body to God as a living sacrifice, by default, your body is presented to Satan as a living sacrifice. Because human beings were created by God such that they cannot run themselves. You only become truly a child of God, truly a son of God, when you are guided by the Spirit of God. Right. Let us go to John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. Say, today I'm learning, today I'm learning. That, I that I am not my body. Say, today I'm learning. That I am not my pot. And that what I do with my pot has spiritual implications. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you do wrong things to your pot, it means you are glorifying Satan. If you do the right things, you worship God with your pot, it means you are glorifying God. And all of that has got what? Implications. Say what I do with my pot has got both temporal and eternal implications. That's one thing which I want to know, even as we talk about healing. Because healing has got a purpose. Healing in this generation, I will say is a statement which is not very controversial. Healing in this generation is not meant to remove all sicknesses. Because to, for God to remove all sicknesses, it's very simple. God has to remove sin. Because sickness and sin, they are just, I mean, they are twins. When you have sin, you have got sickness automatically. Sickness comes as a consequence of sin. If human beings had no sin, there would be no sicknesses. There would be no strife. There would be no tribalism. In fact, even languages, they wouldn't exist because human beings will be perfectly aligned to God. The reason why there are sicknesses, not only sicknesses, all sorts of things which cause us pain, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, is because human beings are fallen. They are misaligned from God. To say human beings are fallen, it, we, we simply mean they are misaligned from God. Because God is not just another person. Look at your neighbor and say, God is not just another person. He is our creator. You know, God is so infinitely, uniquely different from, uh, from us. In the sense that, you know, between God and his creatures, there is an infinite gulf. There is a gulf which is infinite, both in terms of distance and dimension. The gulf between God and his creation is infinite, both in terms of distance and dimension. What do I mean? What I mean is God is in a class of his own and the class of God is called the class of the creator. Everything else which you see besides God is a created entity, is a created thing. Look at your neighbor and say you are a created entity. Say no matter how strong and smart you are, you can't be smarter than God. Because he's the one who created you. Hallelujah. Amen. So, no matter how clever or wiser than God, if God were to decide to be foolish, still there is no wise man on earth who will be wiser than the foolishness of God. It's the statement which I just spoke in English, it's called a hyperbole. Because it's impossible for God to be foolish. 
But we are saying, in a situation where if all things are possible, because with God all things are possible, and then God decides to be foolish, still in his foolishness he would be far much wiser than the wisest of all men or the wisest of all angels. Because he's the creator. Amen. Say he's the creator. That's why God decided to bring about salvation with the foolishness of the cross. The cross does not make sense to someone who is carnal. How it is linked to our salvation. The blood of Jesus Christ falling onto an earth which God had cursed in the book of Genesis chapter 3. It doesn't make academic sense how that can heal the whole earth as a planet. But where did the planet come from? From God himself. Hallelujah. Say God is infinitely wiser than me. Say God is infinitely wiser than me. Say God is infinitely wiser than me. Say God is infinitely more powerful than me. Because why am I emphasizing Jesus? Why am I emphasizing God? Because healing does not come from pastors. It doesn't come from prophets. It doesn't come from evangelists. Healing comes from God. Healing comes from God. Let me tell you something. Your existence, your ability to come to this church service, your ability to do, right now we have been worshiping God, praising, dancing, standing before God. That ability comes from God. Everything you are able to do comes from God. Say thank you, God. Thank you, God. For everything that you have given me. Today we don't want to just focus on God in general. As I introduce the message which is entitled, Jesus Christ our healer, which I'm going to finish next week. I want us to focus on an aspect or a dimension of God, which is healing. What is healing? Look at your neighbor and say, what is healing? Say, what is healing? Say, what is healing? Say, what is healing? You know, healing is a process. I checked it's several definitions. You know, as I was meditating on this message, healing is a process of the body or the soul or the human being being restored to their original position. And your original position is not the position that you were born with. Because for some people, they were born with sicknesses. There are some people who are born with sicknesses. That's not your original position. Your original position is the situation or position which Adam was at before he sinned against the court. We never read about Adam suffering from flu or suffering from stomach pain in the book of Genesis chapter 2. We start to read about sicknesses sometime later in the Bible that some people could be barren. We start to read later in Genesis of a woman called Sarai, who later became called Sarah, who had a sickness of barrenness. Some diseases are painful, some are not painful. And the most dangerous diseases are the diseases which don't exert any pain on your point. Hallelujah. There are some people you hear that the person was healthy, he just collapsed. No, there's nothing like that. A person who collapses and dies, it means they were sick, but the symptoms were not obvious. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and ask them, and say, are you really healthy? <laughs> Hallelujah. I, 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 I watched a certain clip on the internet of a person, a man of God, who was preaching in the United States of America. When he finished this sermon and he sat on a chair, he died. Hallelujah. I know the brothers and sisters in church, they will say God took him. It's true, but he died. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Say, but he died. No matter how much we try to cross over it, God says because you have eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat, you shall surely want die. You are going to die. You will eat 
from the sweat of your brow, your face. Your face. You will eat from your own sweat until you die. Which means human beings were never designed by God to sweat for food. To sweat for anything. Do you think the, the billions, zillions of angels that are in heaven, they sweat for anything? They don't sweat for anything. The angels that never sinned against God, they don't have any experimental knowledge of what pain is. They don't know what pain is. An angel like Gabriel or Michael has never experienced any pain. They, they've got no knowledge, no experiential or experimental knowledge of pain. But we human beings who have got experiential or experimental knowledge of what? Of pain. Because we experimented with something which we were not supposed to experiment with. We experimented with the law of God by breaking the law of God in Adam. Because someone will quickly say, but I was not there. You were there in Adam. Hallelujah. If your parents came from Europe, you were once in Europe in your parents. That's why now, if, you, if your parents originated from France, do you know that you can go to France and reclaim your citizenship? Do you know why that is the case? Because when they were in France, you were in them. That's how even the law, family law, actually reasons worldwide, the Roman Dutch law. It reasons that way. There is someone that we were working with in Kwanda. His mother was born in South Africa. He's a Nube. His mother was born in South Africa. I mean in South Africa. The mother is South African. That guy, he decided when the economy started to misbehave here in Zimbabwe, he decided after all, I am half South African and half Zimbabwean. Let me take the other half and go with my family. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. He reclaimed his South African citizenship on the basis of his mother, not even the father. Because the father is Zimbabwean. I think they are from Matoche or whatever, near Matopoe. He reclaimed his citizenship in South Africa. Why? Because when the mother, because the mother was born and grew up in South Africa. So he was in his mother. If the mother had not come to Zimbabwe, the guy was going to be born in South Africa with another surname. Hallelujah. So when Adam was busy, eating the, the fruit that Eve had provided. We were in them, eating as well. All human beings were in them, eating as well. Say we were in them, eating as well. Let me illustrate. If your parents, they decide to, to be hardworking, they decide to be hardworking until they are billionaires. You, without working, to be a billionaire will start to live the life of a billionaire yourself as a child. Why? Because in your parents now, you would have been working to be a what? To be a billionaire. So if your parents do wrong things, you are in trouble, especially before you are born. If they do make wrong decisions, you are in serious trouble. It means when you are born, you have to remedy the wrong decisions that they actually made. Hallelujah. Say thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. For, disconnecting me for disconnecting me from my past. From my past. John chapter 14, verse 26, very quickly, and I pray for people. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Hallelujah. And when the Holy Spirit has come into us, where exactly does it stay? Where exactly does it dwell? Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So that we examine where exactly the Holy Spirit dwells. It says in verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13. Foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Do you hear now the function of the body? We read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we must, you know, we must present our bodies unto God, verse 1 and verse 2. 
that we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. Now the Bible is telling us that our bodies, they actually belong to what? To God. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the board. Just to check, this, I think there are kids who are playing with it now. Hallelujah. It says now the board is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the board. Do you realize that when, when it comes to your, in your relationship with God, your board is very much involved? Say, when it comes to my relationship with God, my body is very much involved. Which is why now if you read the four synoptic gospels, most of the healings that were taking place were healings of the pot. Most of the healings, if not all of them, save for the people who were insane, they in the synoptic gospel. God was actually healing people's bodies. He is in the business of healing people's bodies. Why? Because of that reason. Now the pot is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. The body belongs to God. Say, my body belongs to God. Now, if your body belongs to God, why are you saying my body? You are saying my body because of your relationship to the pot, not your ownership of the pot. Because if God wants to take your pot, there is nothing which you can do about it. When God decides not to sustain your pot, you can't do a thing about your pot. Say, when God decides to take my pot, for his purposes, I can't do a thing. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us of a, of a rich fool who prepared a lot of food to a very wealthy fool. Because some people who are, who are wealthy you think they are wise. But some of them are fools. In fact, I almost said most of them are fools. But some of them are fools. One wealthy fool was saying on the internet, these people who go to church, sometimes they amaze me. They go there, they'll be saying, God, God, but you can't even see the God that they're talking about. But, I mean, the, the, the wealthy fool who has never seen his intestines, if I were to tell him that there are electrical wires inside his stomach, would he believe that? By the time we open his stomach, he won't be living anymore, you see to show him his intestines. The wealthy fool, if I told him that inside your skull there is dust there. There are so many things. I'm just mentioning things in the physical. Things which are physical, which we know are there. I don't even want to mention angels or mention bacteria and other things. I just want to mention things which are in the physical point. You will be a fool for you to say I don't have a brain because you have never seen it. You don't need to see a lot of things for you to believe in them. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You just need to know. Say I just need to know. I just need to know. And one of the things that you need to know is that there is God who created you. Just like I know I've got a mother and a father. But I can't really prove that I've got a mother and a father that I was really born, I can start to believe that I fell from a tree and you can't do anything to me about it. Because when I was born, I couldn't see anything. I was incapable of seeing when I was born. I have to rely on other people's testimony that well, this is actually your mother. Do you know that in Shona they say uh, knowing a grandmother is being told, but even knowing a mother and a father too, Because how do you know that your mother is really your mother? You were told just the same way I as a pastor am telling you that God is your Say God is my God. Say God is my God. Say God is my God. One, you don't need to see God for you to believe that God is there. You just need to see things which are around. Where do you think they came from? Do you think it's the government that created them? Do you think it's the government which created the rivers? The government of Smith which created the trees and the rivers? It's God. Say it's God. It's God. Say it's God. It's God. Say it's God. It's God. 
Some people, when they were born, their parents had already died. If I told them, if I went to a person who became an orphan immediately after they were born, and I tell them that you don't have parents, you fell from the sky, they will think I'm crazy. Are we together? But can they prove now? They can't bring their parents forward for them to prove that they've got parents. But at the same time, they won't believe my foolishness. Do you realize that I can't show you God? It doesn't mean anything. I'm just like a person whose parents, they died. I'm not saying God died. God is somewhere in another dimension of existence where we cannot see. But when we contact the spirit of God, because the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the pot. Which means God actually wants to use your pot. Which is why he has sent me to preach about what? Healing. Because when you are not healed in your pot, you will focus on your illness instead of focusing on God. Which is why God wants to heal your pot. So that he can use you in these last days. Say God is going to use me in these last days. And he will restore my body completely. Say whatever is wrong with my pot. Just put that scripture again. Say whatever is wrong with my pot. It is being restored right now. In Jesus' mighty name. It say now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the pot. So it means God actually possesses your pot. He's the owner. You possess your body in the sense of being a steward. Because you are not the one who created it. You are a steward. Say, I'm a steward. I am a steward. Say, I am a steward. I am a steward. Of my body. A steward is just a supervisor. A supervisor who looks like an owner. Say, I am a steward. I am a steward. Of my physical body. Of my physical body. Say, today, today, the owner of my body is going to heal my pot. Say my pot is going to be restored completely. In Jesus mighty name. Say my pot is going to be restored completely. In Jesus mighty name. Say today is my day of restoration. In Jesus mighty name. Say the Lord for the pot. And the body for the Lord. Say my body belongs to God. Hallelujah. 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 Verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Your body is not your human spirit, but your what? Your bodies, your physical bodies are members of Christ. Shall I take, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? So here the Bible is explaining to us the dynamics of sexual activity. That when people are involved in sexual activity, they actually become one. Hallelujah. When people are involved in sexual activity, it's one way in which two, two people who are married or even not married, they become one in the realms of the spirit. Hallelujah. 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 For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Because God is, doesn't have any flesh. So when you join the Lord, you become what? A spirit. Or your spirituality comes to the fore. When you join yourself to the Lord. Flee sexual immorality. Look at your neighbor and say, flee sexual immorality. Say, flee sexual immorality. That's one kind of sin which is uh, quite unique because the Bible doesn't say resist sexual immorality.
Because no one among us can resist sexual immorality. Except if you are a eunuch or a female eunuch or a male eunuch. In that case, you won't be even resisting because there's something which will be missing. It's like a person who doesn't have a sense of taste or who doesn't have appetite. If we put nice food in front of them, they, we can't say they are resisting food. They don't have appetite. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe those people are exempted from this script. The eunuchs. If someone is a eunuch, in the Bible, there, were, there, there are a number of people who are eunuchs. I will mention to you some of the eunuchs that are very famous in the Bible. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were eunuchs. Ah, you couldn't save in the royal palace if you were not castrated. Because Nebuchadnezzar, if you read the history of the Babylonian kingdom, the Nebuchadnezzar and the entire royal family of Nebuchadnezzar, they believed that they were descendants of the gods. So they couldn't take in foreigners who would end up sleeping with their children and polluting divine blood, so to speak. Actually, when you go and read Daniel chapter 1, you realize that Daniel and his friends, they were part of a group of eunuchs. They were castrated for them to save in the royal palace. That's why the Bible never talks about Daniel's wife. And that's why Daniel was so spiritual. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't say anything for you to laugh. I said Daniel was so spiritual. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of the wars that ordinary men, mere men fight, they were very foreign to Daniel. His passion was God. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, for you to arrive at the dimension of Daniel, God has to supernaturally make you a eunuch. Such that this kind of sin, it will not be able to touch you. Because this is the sin which is destroying many Christians. Hallelujah. Amen. Sexual immorality. Say sexual immorality. Sexual immorality has got very serious implications. It may not cause you to be diseased in your physical body, but definitely it will damage your spirituality. Yes. Because you are a spirit. Say, because I'm a spirit. A spirit. When, I God, when I disconnect myself from God and connect myself to someone, myself to someone through sexual immorality, it pollutes my, my inner man. Which is why today I invoke the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse our inner man. Hallelujah. Amen. If you had the habit of practicing sexual immorality, you must know this day, I don't normally preach like this, but if you have, if you have got a habit or you had a habit, I want to believe that it's a head, not a head. Look at your neighbor and say, I would want to believe that it's a head, not a head. If you had the habit of doing sexual immorality, I invite you, my brother, my sister, as a spirit, I am talking to you as a spirit, that God is inviting us in these last days, especially in 2019, that we must be purified. Because God showed me on, on the 29th of December, that, you know, I spoke with the message without going into details at the, at the city hall, that the devil has released a lot of sexual demons this year. For many serious Christians, the devil, you won't concentrate on causing financial problems or all of that nonsense. He will just concentrate on making us sexually immoral. So that the things which God has prepared for us in 2019 will be disconnected from them. And there are a lot of miracles which God has prepared for his children in 2019. For some, it's marriages. For some Christians, before the year ends, you are supposed to be a millionaire with a multi-million dollar business. But if you do sexual immorality, you are finished. Because the moment you do sexual immorality, you are taking your body from God and connecting it to what? To Satan. If there is a sin that we must flee like Joseph, it's the sin of sexual immorality. Amen. You may be a David in praise, a Jeremiah in prophecy, 
a Daniel in intercession, a Stephen in signs and wonders. But if you are not a Joseph in sexual discipline, you are finished. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is inviting all of us, pastors included. Look at your neighbor and say, pastors included. Pastors. And their wives too included or their husbands. Because some pastors are women. Say, all people are invited by God. To be sexually pure. It doesn't matter. Maybe you did sexual immorality yesterday. Or last night. Or a few hours ago. But God is saying, from now onwards, going forward, you must know that your body belongs to God. And that God actually belongs to your body. This scripture is so parry. Just go backwards a bit. I want to read the scripture before that. It says, the body for the Lord. And the Lord for the what? For the pot. That God actually belongs to your pot. Say God belongs to my pot. Do you know why he belongs to your pot? You will see when we, leave, when we read the last two verses there. Verse 19. It says, uh, you have gone too far back. Just go back once a bit. Just go back once. Verse 17, you are skipping verse 17. All right, let me check the verse and read the verse that I want. Maybe it's earlier than verse 17. Let me read it. It says, it's verse 13. It says, now the body is for is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the want For the pot. The body is for the Lord. And the Lord for the want For the pot. I know that we normally say, hey, my spirit belongs to the Lord. No, everything. The whole package belongs to God. The whole package. I want us to lift up our hands and say, Father, in the past, I abused my pot by presenting it to sin as a living sacrifice. And I now know that sin causes death. I disconnect myself from sin. And I ask you, Almighty God, to heal and to restore my pot and to forgive me for my sins. May you erase all of my sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, my brother, my sister, if you are listening to this message, you are seated here, you are listening to this message, or you are on the internet, you have been praying for breakthroughs. And after this message, you do sexual immorality, you might as well stop praying because none of your prayers are going to be answered by God. That's one sin which, which we, all of us, pastor, evangelist, prophet, major prophet, major apostle, whatever you are called, whatever title you have, we must flee. You want sexual immorality. All of us, we must flee, even the appearance of what? Sexual immorality. In 2019, God showed me on the 29th of December. You can check the messages that I spoke for, for, for at, the, at the crossover. I didn't emphasize the message, and the message was not viral. But it's one of the most important prophecies that I spoke. That the devil will, will be wrestling against the marriages in 2019. Hallelujah. And this favorite weapon of choice, his favorite weapon of choice for destroying marriages is sexual immorality. Is sexual immorality. Or oh, the woman starts to be arrogant because she has been promoted. But in most cases, arrogance among two married people comes from either a journey towards sexual immorality or sexual immorality itself. And God said, at the right time when I send you, not at your own time, Tell my children that the devil is destroying them through sexual immorality. And that's why even churches are not growing. 
Christians who are supposed to be multi-millionaires are, are nowhere near finances. You know when, when Jesus Christ came, preached the gospel from the port of Peter, when he finished preaching the gospel, he told Peter, now you can use your boat, which I've been using, to catch the fish. Jesus Christ, Peter says, I've been toiling the whole night. Jesus says, don't worry. The one who had no sin, he commanded the fish and they came. And Peter said, go away from me, Lord, yes. because I'm a sinner. Even the fish could detect that a sinner was trying to catch them. <laughs> Even the fish, he toiled at night. When ordinarily you are supposed to be able to catch fish, he was not able to catch anything with his friends. But when someone without sin came during the day, the fish, they came to him. The more we die to sin, the more the things which God has reserved for us in the spirit, they will come to us. We won't go to things, things will come to us. Look at your neighbor and say, don't go to things. Let things come to you. Say, don't go to things. Someone, I, I once talked to someone who was in a sexually impure relationship. They said, now, but the person is helping me to support my children. In, in the first place, sexual immorality should not support your children. Because it will be planting cases in the lives of your children. Pray to God and God will give you a clean solution. The devil will be destroying your future and the future of your children. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Say from now onwards, from now onwards I, am I am going to flee sexual immorality. Ah, this one, even if you are a pastor, even if you are a major one, who causes people to vibrate when you stretch forth your hands, you have to what? Run. <laughs> flee sexual immorality. If your boss comes and says, hey, your outfit, your outfit looks nice, your outfit, and to say, I but it didn't touch me, it touched my clothes, it's going somewhere. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going somewhere. <laughs> say, it's going somewhere. Today, I am preaching like a firebrand. When you see me preaching, you must know that the season has changed. When you hear me preaching, you must know that the season has changed. I'm not a preacher myself. It's my wife who is a preacher. She has tried several times to do teaching. And I would be watching her on my phone, trying to be a Bible teacher. You can't be what you are not. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't be what you are not. <laughs> when you see me preaching, you must know that a season has shifted in the spirit. Because I'm not, a, I'm not a preacher myself. But when you see me with an unction to preach, you must know that the season has shifted in the spirit. <laughs> That the game, the game has shifted in favor of Christians. But what is God saying to Christians? Flee sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. Flee, 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 flee. With, flee. Work with your feet when it comes to sexual immorality. Flee, flee. Say from now onwards. I am going to flee sexual immorality. I will not resist it. There is a pastor, I almost mentioned his name. He's a very powerful man of God who is based in Venderland. He was telling us a story when I was still in Gwanda. That one day, a certain lady came to his office. He's got a very big ministry. And this lady, a very young lady, young enough to be his daughter, came into his office. How can I help you, my daughter? And the woman said, Pastor, I want to have sex with you. She didn't even greet the pastor. She told the pastor, Pastor, I've come here for one thing. I want to have... <laughs> Hallelujah. And the pastor, he says, you know, he's not normally shocked as an anointed man of God, but at that time... <laughs> Hallelujah. The pastor was shocked. Was shocked by a young kid. He says, Ha! He said, But I'm a man of God. I'm your father in the Lord. And the pastor tells us that the girl repeated and said, Pastor, I said, I want to have sex with you. <laughs> and when the pastor said, Get out of my office, she went out. She didn't even move very quick, she just went out. 
disappeared for some days from the church and then came again. When she came to the church, she visited the office of the pastor when the pastor was busy meditating in the spirit, playing some gospel music in the background. And said, Pastor, didn't you hear what I said? I said, I want to have sex with you. And now the pastor decided to tell his wife diplomatically. Look at one up and say, beware of diplomas. <laughs> he said to his wife, there is a sister who wants to have a love relationship with me. <laughs> ah, because how do you tell your wife that? Because the wife will say, it means there is a relationship. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the wife said, who is that sister? Who is that? She wanted to navigate in the natural. And the woman might have been a satanist. And the pastor said, no, 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 no. I'm not wrestling against the flesh and blood. I didn't sleep with her. That's why I'm telling you. And then the woman, the woman came for the third time after the pastor had told his wife. And said, pastor, I don't know what kind of a man you are. I told you that I want to have sex with you. And the pastor refused. And this time around, he went and told the church. After he told the church, that sister left the church service. He told the church that there is a woman who is saying she wants to sleep with me. Do you know he was telling us why he told his wife and why he told the church? He's saying I was diffusing the effects of sin. He is saying, he told us, I remember he told us more than 10 years ago. He said, I was, when I revealed it to my wife, I know that after revealing it to my wife, I couldn't do it. I was diffusing the effects of what? Of sin. If your wife or your husband is a very emotional person, which is nomad, you can go and tell someone who is a mother or a father fig that there is someone who wants to have a relationship with me. I want you to assist me and my wife in prayer. The person keeps coming. Hallelujah. Because such people are very sophisticated. If you work with such a person who is in your environment, if you resist them and you don't use wisdom, they can claim that you are trying to rap them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the pastor says he was trying to diffuse the effects of sin. That lady, when he told the church, the lady never came back again. She disappeared. I think she was a satanist. And then there is this other story that I was also I also heard from T.K. Olukoy. Some of you have read books by T.K. Olukoy. He was preaching in one of these mecca prayer meetings of his. And he was saying, he was preaching about powers of darkness. He was saying one evening, a, a man and his wife, they were seated with their children in the living room, the lounge. And a woman just came and said, spoke, the woman spoke to the wife, not to the man. He spoke to the wife and said, woman, I don't know who you are. I've come to take you, it happened in Nigeria. I've come to take your husband for three weeks. The woman couldn't speak anything. The man couldn't speak anything. And after that, that's pure satanism. It, sexual immorality doesn't normally happen like that. But in case the sexual immorality which has been pulling you back when you try to rise is demonic in nature, we are breaking it in the name of Jesus Christ. It is broken in the name of Jesus Christ. So this woman, after talking to the wife, the wife never argued, she never fought, she just sat there like a statue. Just sat in herself. She couldn't say anything. And then this woman said to the man, pack your things and let us go. She packed his thing, I mean he packed his things. A few things, carried a small bag and followed the woman. Disappeared actually for more than three weeks. And when he came back, he was no longer in his senses. Say pure witchcraft. <laughs> now, why am I telling you these stories? Because there's a link between sexual immorality and demonic worship. If you read in the Bible, in the Old Testament, 
If you read the story of how the sons of Eli fell into sin, you realize that they were doing sexual activity in the temple. There is a link between worship and sex. Because worship is communion with God, it causes you to be one with God. Worship is the equivalent of, it's in the spirit the equivalent of sexual intercourse in the natural. It, it unifies upon you. Worship unifies upon you to God. And sexual activity also unifies upon you to a person. Someone might be saying, ah, but I'm not going to suffer any sicknesses because I wear a condom. And the woman will be wearing a condom as well. Now you can't wear a condom for your inner man. Will your inner man be wearing a condom as well? Today we are speaking like it is because the spirit of God told me that's why I delayed coming to this place. I knew I was going to come with the, a message which is not very palatable. But when we eat this message according to the spirit of God and we flee sexual immorality, there are millionaires in this place. There are professors in this place. There are business women and businessmen in this place. There is no limit to how far you can rise. There is no limit to how far you can rise in Christ. There is no limit. In my, according to my knowledge of how spiritual things operate, there are two major things which invite demons in their thousands. It's idolatry, the worshipping of wrong gods, and sexual activity outside of marriage. If you want demons, if you want demons in their thousands and possibly in their millions, go and worship gods which are not gods, which is idolatry or idol worship. Or, or go and engage in sexual immorality. You get demons, all kinds of demons. Some demons which may not even affect you, which will affect your children in the fifth generation you get to them. All sorts of sophisticated demons. Demons which speak ancient languages which no longer exist. Which when they manifest, they speak languages you don't even know what kind of a language it is. They enter through idol worship. When people are kneeling, they consume laws. But in Amatam Zimu, spirits they flood into their lives in their thousands. They'll be saying the pastor is not seeing reserve. When you hear me speaking in Shona, it means a season has changed. It means a season has changed. Hallelujah. Today a season has what? Changed. A season has what? Shifted. There is a shift in the spirit. They'll be saying pastor Anagus Wona. It's not about your pastor, it's about the pastor upstairs. The pastor upstairs sees everything. Two doors that God told me about. Two doors that I'm going to fight. I know these doors I will fight for. To safeguard these doors. The door of sexual immorality and the door of idol worship. Door of sexual immorality, when we keep that door shut and to keep the door of worshiping what are not gods as though they are gods, you keep it shut, pray your prayers, you'll start to see answers. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And God sent me to tell you that in 2019, two major things that Satan will be doing against the church. Polluting the worship of the church and polluting the bodies of the members of the church. That's, that's what Satan will be doing the most. Sexual immorality and spiritual immorality. God sent me with a message that Jesus Christ has come to his church to cleanse his church. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Can I Christo? Hallelujah. If you are a Christian, if as Christians, whether pastor or not a pastor, whether prophet or not a prophet, the Holy Spirit is saying this afternoon, we must not eat from the bean. We must eat from the temple. Because in Psalm chapter 23, the Bible says, he set a temple before me, not a bean. It's a temple, my brother. Say it's a temple, my sister. Hallelujah. It's not a pin. The Holy Spirit is saying to the church, to the churches in Zimbabwe and all over the world, who search came up in. 
We must flee idol worship. We must flee sexual immorality, says the Spirit of God. You realize I'm not talking about healing. Yes. But God is actually healing the church. Even as we are releasing this message. And God is releasing a grace. If you had a weakness, because some of us we call sexual immorality a weakness. No, it's not a weakness. It's a weapon that Satan is using against you. And today, today you are defeating it in the name of Jesus Christ. Today I am defeating it in the name of Jesus Christ. Say today I'm defeating it in the name of Jesus Christ. Because sexual immorality and idol worship, these are demons. Sexual immorality is an evil spirit. It's a class of evil spirits. There is a principality of sexual immorality, which is why sex, if you go to the internet, is called an industry. How can sex be an industry? And there are people who are called sex workers as if they are the only ones who are able to do sex. You hear that a person is a sex worker. How do you make sex work? It should work in a marriage. Look at your neighbor and say it should work in a marriage. Not in the streets or somewhere in brothels or wherever. It should work in a marriage. Today God is bringing through this message. If there are sex workers in church, your work is ending. You will become workers of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We are not condemning anyone. We are condemning the sin because the sin is a column for the devil to be inverting our lives and neutralizing our prayers. Our prayers are very powerful. Do you know how powerful your prayers are? There was a time when I was fasting in 2007. When I was involved in a fast, I was engaged in a fast. And then in this fast, I fell asleep. It was a trance. It was not real sleep. I experienced that many times. You can ask Brother Ambos. I experienced it even, I think, yesterday. If I'm not mistaken, I experienced it yesterday afternoon. If you are looking at me, you will be thinking I'm sleepy. Most people, they will be saying, you didn't have enough sleep. We will leave you like that. So I fell into a trance. And in this trance, I was in a huge hall where Christians were praying. They were praying and worshiping God. Do you know what I was seeing? When they were worshiping and dancing to God, I was seeing flames of fire. They would magnify themselves until there was fire all over the place. And when they were speaking words or singing words, they were releasing fire into the atmosphere. And I was seeing... This thing is happening and I also began to sing and to, to pray unto God because I was among them. And then I woke up. That's when I understood that when we are praying, we are not just saying words, we are releasing fire into the atmosphere. When we are singing, you are not just singing words, you are releasing fire into the atmosphere. Why does the devil cause us, likes us when we are singing? Because it neutralizes our prayers. It neutralizes our prayers. It neutralizes our blessings. It neutralizes our witness for Christ. It neutralizes everything about us. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. And God today is giving all of us grace. To what? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Say today, today. I am more. Say today, today, I am more than a conqueror. I think these are partners. Say today, today, I am more than a conqueror. When I'm like this, I can use my voice. Say today, today I, am I am more than a conqueror. I fear in this, in this service, are you are breaking through that. I've got faith which doesn't have doubt in itself. I've got faith which doesn't have doubt in itself. I've got faith which doesn't have doubt in itself. If you are in an unequal relationship, you must abandon it today, says the Spirit of God. Abandon it and God will give you an equal relationship. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying. You know, I'm a very soft man. Uh, uh, uh. I'm one of those who call sexual activity outside of marriage weaknesses. Uh. But when the Holy Spirit comes on me, he calls a spade a spade, not a very big spoon, or a spoon with a wrong shape. 
when the Holy Spirit comes on me. I'm like a voice which is shouting, not in the wilderness, but inside the building. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. God sent me with a message of healing to his church to say, I, my church, I am searching my church. That's what the Holy Spirit is saying. He sent me, I've been speaking prophecies for Zimbabwe, but today God sent me with a message for his church. He's saying to all in the church, to all brethren from the leadership to the generality of the members in the body of Jesus Christ, I must announce the arrival of a new season. Where God, where God is cleaning his church, where Jesus Christ has visited the church with eyes which are like flames of fire. I'm not talking about a pastor. I'm not talking about a prophet. I am talking about God. Where God is visiting his church and is patching it. He's removing all the chaff from the church. And from today, look at, look at your neighbor and say it from today. The church will become very strong because Jesus will remove the chaff. He's removing the chaff. We're not charging anyone. And the Holy Spirit is saying, the time to repent is when we hear this message. That's the time for us to repent and to rectify our act. Because Jesus Christ has actually come to prepare his church so that he can release blessings upon his church. There is a wealth transfer that God showed me more than five years ago. It has been refusing to come to the church because the church looks like sinners who are sophisticated, who are carrying Bibles. But that is changing according to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And in Zimbabwe, why are we suffering like this? God is purifying the church. He's causing us to do soul searching. He's causing us as the church to fast and to do what? Soul searching. Because to get a little breakthrough, you will have to fast. You have to press in on God. You have to fast. You have to press in on God. Oh yes, oh yes. And in the process, your inner man will be purified. And you are better prepared for the master's use. Say, the master is going to use me. In these last, last days, I especially you, I see you breaking through. Don't worry about what was happening in your past. The past is, the past is, the past is, the past is, the past is. Don't allow condemnation to be in your heart because the message has come with the healing and restoration. Yes. Only that from now onwards, you must make a resolute decision. Yes. That I will not yield myself to fleshly appetites. Yes. Because I want to present my pot as a living sacrifice before God. I will read only one incident where Jesus Christ healed someone and then we stand up for prayer. Oh, Shimando Stakai. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. I've got no doubt. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Whether you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit or you don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't change what I feel. I know and I know and I know and I know that the Holy Spirit is in this place. And that the Holy Spirit is touching all those who are listening to this message. The Holy Spirit is touching you. There are people who are watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, who will be watching us. The Holy Spirit is touching you through this message. And God is purifying your conscience. Not through acts of righteousness, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. And God is fortifying our conscience so that we are able to resist iniquity. And from today, we will resist iniquities. We will not yield our bodies to sexual immorality. From today, it shall be never again. Let us say from today, from today it, shall be never again. it shall be never again. Say from today, from today it, shall be never again. it shall be never again. Say from today, from today it, shall be never again. it shall be never again. Let me finish off 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the pot. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own pot. You remember, the Lord is for the pot and the pot is for the Lord. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Say the Holy Spirit is in me. Whom you have from God and you are not your own. The Holy Spirit is from God. And we ourselves, spirit, soul, and body, we are not our own. We belong to God. Say, I belong to Jesus. Say, I belong to Jesus. For you were bought at a price, the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Everything in us belongs to God. Say everything about me belongs to God. Say everything about me belongs to God. So I, wa I want to read only one incident where Jesus Christ healed someone. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 up to verse 3. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 up to verse 3. It says, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Today, God is willing to make all of us clean. And God, he is not only willing to make all of us clean. Through this message, he is actually cleaning us. Amen. Let us confess and say, God is cleaning us. Say, God is cleaning me. Through the message of the Holy Spirit. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. Say, today I am cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So diseases are like dead. They can be cleansed from us. Which is what God is doing. Let us stand in the presence of God. <laughs>